George Bush doesn't care about black people. Our ed education, like such as in South Africa and uh, the Iraq, everywhere like such as, and... We sitting here, I supposed to be the franchise player, and we in here talking about practice. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Oh, Charlie! Oh! Our next door neighbors are foreign countries. I call upon all nations to do everything they can to stop these terrorist killers. Thank, Thank you. you. Now watch this drive. Suit up, everyone. We have a legend. Wait for it. I should. I should have put a suit on man i didn't even think about that we have a legend wait for it dairy podcast for you today so roll up a sandwich sit back and enjoy our retrospective on how i met your mother Okay, so The Office is the most iconic sitcom of the 2000s. In terms of its impact today, it feels like the Friends or the Seinfeld of the decade. And it's still so beloved uh, that it generates billion dollar streaming deals and a nostalgia podcast from the cast that's actually the eighth most listened to podcast in the world right now. Uh, each season averaged between five to nine million viewers per episode. But what if I told you there was another sitcom that was on during the 2000s? And it was just one. There was another one. <laughs> there was one other uh, sitcom, and it was structured like Friends and Seinfeld. It averaged millions more viewers per episode than The Office and had a fan base so loyal that unlike The Office, as the show got worse, it averaged more viewers. And unlike shows like The Big Bang Theory, How I Met Your Mother dominated ratings amongst younger viewers, a key demographic in television. So that's why we want to talk about How I Met Your Mother today, because it has almost no cultural relevance relevance today and because of how well it parallels the decade as a whole. So how is it possible that this show, which seemed to be the marquee sitcom of the era and yet culturally passed through us like Olestra chips? Yeah, I, I like the analogy when we're talking about pieces of pop culture of something like the tree of life, where you can see all the different evolutionary descendants of something. And there definitely are pieces of 2000 pop culture that help explain our pop culture in this moment today. So you can think of The Sopranos leading to the boom of prestige drama with your sad man anti-hero. You can think of Jon Stewart's Daily Show in the 2000s leading to every single late night now being about like a shitty political take. Even Jimmy Kimmel famously hosted of the man show a guy who did blackface on comedy central now is a you know gun control advocate on late night these are little data that you can see uh, little pieces of the puzzle that help explain pop culture today but i find what's more interesting is the evolutionary creatures of pop culture that didn't make it and how i met your mother is definitely one of those and we brought on for this the first episode of remember shuffle an absolute expert witness a man <laughs> who has watched this show i don't even know how many times a man who has performed the fish list live. We can get into yeah. that later. Yeah, to answer your question, I don't know how many episodes I watched, how many hours I went into this, but I do know that at the show's height, I very regularly dreamt entirely novel episodes constructed of uh, clips. Uh, an episode of How I Met Your Mother, in a very not carry forward to other sitcom ways, had like 50 flashbacks, like 120 <laughs> scenes per 22 minute episode episode for some reason and that, that really uh lends itself well to you forget what episode a scene is from and your brain just <laughs> shuffles them into a coherent narrative in your sleep it's pretty entertaining yeah. i believe it. Content. do you remember that night sorry we, we we have a rule on this podcast that you can't start any sentence with remember when but that only i feel like that should only apply to pieces of pop culture this is an actual memory of a lived experience that mike and i had remember that night we dressed up in suits and went to the manchester <laughs> and jumped onto a train we jumped yeah, onto a train. It was, it was pretty great. I just remember we mostly ironically would quote this show. We would go like to industry or say we are international businessmen headed to the international business meeting. Yeah. And uh, we were not well liked in the bar that we were at. This piece of performance art went unappreciated. How would you describe How I Met Your Mother? If you had to describe it to some Zoomer who had never watched it. I have my own my own take on it. But let's hear from let's hear from our expert expert witness. Uh, epinimus. Wait, no, what? It's Epinimus. It's 
it's titular. It's <laughs> it's tautological. Uh, the name kind of has it all. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you know, it's a, a boomer, you say? Someone who no, hasn't Zoomer, seen it. But, a young person. Oh, a yeah. Zoomer who hasn't seen it, but may have seen uh, TV in this modern era. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, to go back, maybe, um, though you said it, it doesn't really have any modern descendants. To use all your uh, Evo bio analogy, I'd say um, it foreran some of the features that we do see in surviving television. Um, and re-watching a lot of it actually just kind of led me to re-watching a lot of Always Sunny in Philadelphia, mm. which premiered uh, the same year, but is still going on. And a new season just started. Mm-hmm. And I find they both seem to draw a lot on like what the creators found to be the successes and failures of sitcoms from even like the 90s. And uh, whereas How I Met Your Mother was like a primitive flying lizard bird with long tail and teeth, like a sort of Archaeopteryx of uh, sitcoms. Uh, Always Sunny in Philadelphia took all of those uh, flight adaptations and really rounded them out. Got a beak, lost the teeth, lightweight, uh, pygus style on the tail, and no claws in an adult because those just weigh you down. Um, that is to say, it's a show. I think you might have lost me with this metaphor, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've gone too I'm far. It's about four friends. <laughs> <laughs> It's My it's the apotheosis who, uh, of the uh, city <laughs> yeah bodies. it's the apotheosis of inexplicably successful white people being uh, inexplicably comfortable in their lives uh, and and in a way sort of deconstructing that as it goes on as as you start to see these characters as being uh, more terrible rather than likable yeah especially all of them. we we have a lot to say on the on the likability of the characters and like who is the villain and whether or not the show is self-aware of this. Because I think, for the most part, How I Met Your Mother is not self-aware of the fact that his characters are not great people in a show like like, like Seinfeld or Always Sunny would be. Uh, if I had to describe this show, I would describe it as schizophrenic. It's a real Dr. Oh, Jackal, yeah. Mr. Hyde kind of thing. Because on the one hand, uh, it's very run-of-the-mill and typical, and it feels comfortable doing that. So you have not one, but two will-they-won't-days throughout the show. You have Ted and Robin, and then eventually Barney and Robin. So you have Will They Won't They combined with a love triangle. So very run-of-the-mill kind of sitcom plot. You have guest stars who are brought on for four or six episode arcs to add a little bit of fresh blood, but also act as obstacles in our Will They Won't They. You have a laugh track. Uh, it's clearly filmed on like a lot in Los Angeles somewhere. Um, you have, of course, the character of Barney who we'll get into. It's this absolute catchphrase generator. Uh, but on the other hand, the show will occasionally try and take some risks, which obviously you have the framing device. The show is meant to be a father telling his teenage children how to get through your late 20s and early 30s. This device lets you have fun flashbacks. Like Mike said, there could be something like, there could be, what would you say, like over 100 discrete little scenes in an episode? Yeah, I think the average for the whole series is about 120 scenes per episode. And they average around 50 flashbacks, including flashbacks within flashbacks and flashbacks within flashbacks within flashbacks. Or flash forwards within flashbacks, which you see in like an episode called Trilogy Time in the sixth season, the character characters watch all three Star Wars every three years. And then they flash back to them imagining what the next three years are going to look like. So you can actually yeah. see some risk taking in terms of narrative structure. But inexplicably, they still have a laugh track, right? It's like they have this security blanket of how sitcoms used to be with cheers and friends and what have you. So even though at, at the time that it dropped in 2005, you had sitcoms without laugh tracks that were finding success, like Arrested Development or Malcolm in the Middle even, or The Office had premiered by this point, How I Met Your Mother just reverts to this very comfortable, laugh track, multi-camera sitcom. So that's kind of how I would describe it. And I think this schizophrenic nature explains part of why it doesn't have the long-term success that other stuff does. The laugh track subject, um, I think this is a point towards, or rather against, your statement that the show is not self-aware of it. The creators are adamant that the, the show was written up without a laugh track, shown, cut together to an audience, and then their laughter was recorded and dubbed in. So you have you have the showrunners, uh, first of all, Craig Thomas and Carter Bays, horrible, horrible names. But, um, <laughs> I, I don't like anyone whose name is a body of water, okay? Uh, Rivers Cuomo, no, no, no bodies of water. 
Speaking of the Sorry. showrunners, I think that, you know, who they are sort of obviously lends a lot to like what the show became. And the show is, is transitional in the same way that the decade as a whole is from sort of the movement of, of Gen X shows and creators to like millennial shows and creators later on in the decade. So I think it's, it was definitely directed at millennials, but made by an older showrunner. And as a result, the show felt very instructive. And I was listening to the showrunners talk about what they wanted to do with it. And they said that they turned 30, they moved to LA, and they felt sad that like their days of being 20 in New York were over. And they wanted to somehow like capture that spirit and feeling it and put it in a TV show. And even the show's like explicit structure of having like Bob Saget um, explain the story to his kids sort of matches that uh, the transitional nature of the show that I'm talking about, which is like a movement from Gen X culture to like millennial culture. And so it incorporates all of these old fashioned things um, the same way that Ted wants like a white picket fence marriage you know that the showrunners want this sort of old fashioned sitcom feel with a will they or won't they and, and the laugh track but they, it, they incorporated all of these new awesome things like the flash forwards and flashbacks and serialized story in a sitcom and so they brought these established styles of an older generation um, unlike contemporary millennial targeted shows like Girls or Broad City or even The Office and they the characters are also very aspirational in their goals in a way that later millennial sitcoms or not absolutely and so i just want to sorry i want to get into like why this show is important for the decade and i think it's because like in these aspirations is how this show reflects america in the 2000s it's a show about american exceptionalism okay it's it's optimistic you know after all success is already guaranteed it's in the title he does meet the mother right and so anything you do to get to that end is therefore justified and this is where the show i think takes on a dark side because whether it's (laughs) cheating or ruining other marriages or just having a, a, a delusional self-centered view of fate and ideals anything you do as long as your intentions are good you're, you're fine you're, you're everything is forgiven and i think that's what makes the show so of its era I, things are a lot more like cynical and considered now i think so so look yeah. at america's foreign policy and how it mirrors ted mosby <laughs> okay i'm ready for this take <laughs> Yes, yeah, okay. so the United I, I would... States, it tries to nation build twice in this decade. And it doesn't matter, you know, whose marriage Ted has to ruin or how he has to change Robin to make her compatible or who has to die to make room for Ted's latest infatuation. He will get what he wants due to the divine providence of the title. It's manifest destiny meets dating. How I met your mother. It's yeah, just... it's, it's how I met your meritocracy. It's like I have these insane views of how other people should be and I'm going to project that on them. And then when they don't live up to those expectations, I'm just going to discard them with any consideration for you know their well-being um and that's so that's what ted does right just like the u.s uh, with afghanistan and iraq after uh, we love bomb them quote unquote <laughs> the, cut, the country like ted does when those countries don't reci- reciprocate the ideals we've projected onto them like adhering to democracy they're immediately discarded yeah it's like when france didn't invade iraq with america it's exactly stella leaving ted at the altar <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean One of the interesting things about the 2000s compared to now, this is something that I have been thinking about a lot recently. The first year that I remember everyone saying, man, this year has been shit. Everything was bad. That the first year I remember that happening was 2016. Because in one year, you had a bunch of celebrities die. I mean, we opened with David Bowie and Alan Rickman in January, scandalizing. But then you also had Brexit and Trump. And I remember John Oliver ended his season with like blowing up the numbers 2016. It was like, fuck you, 2016. And every year since then has been bad. And people have been talking about every year, how every year is bad. People started saying, there's so many memes about like, oh, it's 2020. What else can happen? Oh, it's 2021. But this is a huge pivot from like... The late 90s were super optimistic. You famously have the the end of history essay, right? There's no more pol- political debates left to have. And the 2000s are this hinge decade where shit starts to go bad. Especially like what Giordano was saying in the first half of that decade, you still have that like happiness hangover from the 90s. This optimism, this... I mean, certainly it's what the government was pitching was like, I mean, George Bush called the the war on terror a new crusade. We're going to go, we're going to make the world perfect. And it uh, didn't turn out. You're going to make Baghdad Christian again. Uh, and yeah, also uh, we're going to make this random woman the love of my life. Yeah, we're going to make this woman who says she wants no children, doesn't want to get married, is dedicated to her career. We're going to make her the mother of my children. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ted and Robin. But we're actually, gonna, I was we're thinking, just going to hang out for for a bit and see what happens, Robin. We're just going to hang. We're just going to hang out. We know we're not we're not invading. We're not annexing this territory. We're just friends. 
Actually, I was thinking as um, as y'all were talking about the the fan, as Mike, when you mentioned the super fans analyzing the pitch of the laugh track. If you mm-hmm. wanted to fool people into your sh- thinking your show had excellent writing in the 2000s, have a mystery <laughs> and have cryptic clues. I'm thinking Lost. I'm thinking late season X Files. I'm thinking the spiritual successor to the X Files. What the fuck was that show called? <laughs> uh, it's like a Everybody loves Fringe. 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 <laughs> Everybody loves Raymond is in fact the spiritual successor to the Everybody Xbox. Everybody but one person loves Raymond, and you're trying to figure out who the one person is. I don't, I don't think anyone in that show loved Raymond. <laughs> what? Definitely and then obviously, Raymond. I don't know if I mentioned, but like Lost is like you would have people on blogs with like very just nothing but red herrings coming up with elaborate fan theories. And the same was true of How I Met Your Mother. And really, there was no evidence that was given in the show. You could either think it's Robin, they're going to do a bait and switch, or it's not. It's like there's no way that the mother was going to be someone they had already introduced on the show, one of these little four episode arcs. But people still talked about this. Well, there's there's a couple things that they dropped early on that ended up like going with it. Uh, I think uh, season two or three episode, they first reveal the mother's name and and roll with or it. They, they reveal her al- initials, right? No, uh, they uh, do a bit in an episode where Ted's talking to a stripper and she's like, actually, my real name is Tracy cut to the future and that kids is how i met your mother oh, and yeah, yeah. her name does end up being tracy and if the fans were very divided on whether they would uh be that strict with their continuity or not for the whole series and they were the tm T- yeah tm initials thing i don't know if they, they reveal early on mike just tell us like what you love about this show like why does it fill you with warm happiness uh, like what is it about the show that draws you into it? Uh, it as far as sitcoms and its style had at the time, especially uh, this is not so true today. It, I don't think it has aged very well, but when it was on, uh, I really just liked that you could pretty much catch new jokes on every rewatch. It had a lot of background gags that were like very elaborate and fully fleshed out. Something that like community would take much further, but How I Much Your Mother did a lot of it. And um, like, even though there was no mystery, really, uh, ben, Ben's been talking about how, how they had a, a will that two will they or won't they. I don't think they ever intended Ted and Robin to be a will they or won't they because they put the cap on her not being the mother in the first episode. Mm-hmm. However, well, it's like it's like will they or won't they end up together somehow, which is what the show yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. Um, and but the the references to the oh the mother's dead start pretty early on in the series. Um, and they start very subtly and gradually get more and more in your face, but it's kind of exponential instead of linear. So if you haven't really rewatched it a bunch, you probably don't pick up on like uh, Ted reading Love in the Time of Cholera and a few separate scenes mm. to, to communicate. Yeah, the, the romantic oh, lead is going to die. <laughs> Um, okay, and then and just for our any younger listeners who are with us, uh, I know the word meme has evolved. Meme now means any post on the internet, so that your boomers can be like, "Ooh, I saw a meme, and it was a it was a fucking long form article that they call a meme." But back in the day, a meme meant a specific thing. They would have names like good guy Greg or scumbag Steve. And it was just a shitty photo that you would put white text captioned on. Or you would have something like Rage Comics, the ugliest comics you'd ever seen that you could make yourself. That was the worst part of the decade, including 9-11. And some of Barney's catchphrases trickled down into the world of memes. So Barney, and again, we're going to break down all the characters in a bit, he is the most, he begins as the most caricature-esque of the characters. And in doing my research, I found out they actually hired Neil Patrick Harris to play him, not because of how he delivered any lines, but because of his ability at physical comedy. Like, this was a character when they were casting him, it was like, we need a guy who Pratt falls real good. That's the kind of character this guy was. And he would drop these lines that I introduced the show with, like, legend, wait for it, Derry. Or he would tell, say something outlandish, he would say, true story which cropped up in Rage Comics, or Suit Up! And of course, Challenge Accepted, which I'm sure everyone has heard. Yeah, there's a cultural legacy legacy that still exists for How I Met Your Mother. Uh, People accepting challenges. (laughs) No matter what they are, for no reason. (laughs) 
yes, people making their own challenges and then saying challenge accepted after having not being after having not been challenged by anyone. Uh, legacy of this show. One, so, of the, one of the other catchphrases they have is "Nothing good happens after two a.m." Which they're not real New Yorkers. If they, that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's some Los Angeles bullshit right there. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll the have... constant flashbacks and flash forwards are kind of like the the internet streaming meeting serialized cable where you surf around the episode of how i met your mother's on you leave the tv on that channel one of the last shows to be consumed like that so having introduced this show of course it ran for over 200 episodes so we can't exactly give you a summary we're going to talk in broad strokes about the show and then we're going to talk about the ending because i think the ending kind of helps explain why this show disappeared and also why some other shows that were huge in pop culture are no longer talked about today so Let's start with, uh, yeah, the characters. So let's start with uh, Mr. Ted Mosby, who has a great name, but is truly one of like, the worst characters in a sitcom ever. And it's really like a testament to the show that it was as successful as it was with this sort of complete nothing as the protagonist, right? Like This Millhouse. <laughs> yeah, imagine The Simpsons, but Millhouse is the main character. <laughs> it's the Van Houten. It's like... Everything around this is good, but this one guy is bad and not even in a way that's like self-aware. So, you know, Ted is yeah, less bad, more just irritating. Yeah, he's such a nothing that he is a punchline. The actor who plays Ted is a punchline on Bojack Horseman. Bojack says like, who am I, Josh Radner? Nothing? Oh, how quickly we forget. I, I actually remember Josh Radner from Not Another Teen Movie. So I recognized him on the first fucking episode of How I Met Your Mother. I'm like, I know that guy from somewhere. And it's because I've seen... Yeah. <laughs> Mike, Mike was that, a real radhead <laughs> in the early is, 2000s. <laughs> is that the tour guide from Not Another Teen Movie? And it, it was. It was him. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about Ted. You know, have you met Ted? Uh, <laughs> Much like emo music, he, he puts his subject on a pedestal. He love bombs them, which is a term for just sort of like at the beginning of a relationship, like using, professing your love to manipulate someone essentially like way too early and way too much. Um, and then discards them when they don't meet his ideals. And so the take actually has a fantastic video of this on YouTube. I recommend everyone watch it um, about if you're interested <laughs> looking up Ted Mosby YouTube videos uh, about how he basically has like clinical delusional narcissism. Um, <laughs> And so we're going to get into Ted a bit. And first of all, let me just preface this by saying that it's fine if you have a character like that. You can have a hilarious character who has delusional narcissism. That sounds like a great idea for a character. The problem with Ted is that nobody is in on the joke, right? Like he's a stand-in for the audience and the show creators. And like, unlike Barney, um, you're you're sort of not meant to view Ted as a monster. You're, you're meant to view him as like a guy who's looking for love. He's, yeah, he's he's lovesick. He's a, he's just a hopeless romantic. Right. Also, yeah, this is this is a classic uh, rom-com. Rom-com career for a dude is architect. It's mm. like... It's like more artistic than an engineer. You know, engineers are nerds. We can't have those guys. Ted, Ted refers to it as uh, having the soul of an artist, the hands of a master craftsman. In <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, like I said, he's more problematic than Barney. And I, I think the Grinch story is like a good example of this. You know, um, he... What, let's take those two characters' reactions to uh, Marshall and Lily breaking up, right? I mean, you have to remember that both of these people are friends with Lily, right? And, like, therefore should be treating her with some kind of respect. And Ted's reaction is to be like, you don't need that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Barney's... Is that really what he said? I well. <laughs> yeah. And then Barney has to fly to California, convince Lily to come home and tell her, like, never tell anyone that I did this. Like, um, yeah, Don't let anyone know that I was nice and humanized. Yes. I am, I am uh, and for the broken. record, the network TV show does not drop the C word. Yeah. This is, again, some fun with the framing device. Uh, it's a Christmas episode and Lily is called the Grinch. So we don't know that Ted calls her that. He could have called her any slur, I suppose. <laughs> 
stuff. So I have a, actually a suggestion for the show. It could be in order to make the Ted Mosby character sort of in on the joke and to make this a good character, what they should do is just take the laugh track and they have to just adjust like what's getting laughs from Ted. And so whenever t- Ted like will do these speeches, like at the end of an episode where he justifies his terrible behavior by saying something like, she can't say that it's not meant to be. It is meant to be. And you know why? Because I mean it to be. That's where the laugh track should be going off. <laughs> like as he's acting like a psycho, you're laughing and be like, wow, this guy's acting like a, like, like a dangerous person. And when you love someone, you just, you, you don't stop ever. Even when people roll their eyes or call you crazy, even then, especially then, you just, you don't give up because if I could give up, that wouldn't be love. That would be, that would be some other disposable thing when she calls the police and has a restraining order filed. Oh yeah, this is a great, this is why we need you here because I'm about to go through some of the worst things Ted's ever done and feel free to jump in. Like like I said, this show passed through me like a Lester chips and so I don't really remember too much. But from what I can tell, he almost breaks up a couple at their wedding because he wants Robin to come so much. And then 24 hours later, when Robin's late, he's projecting his love onto a new target. He stalks a matchmaking services match that's already engaged. He like goes into her file and finds her information and tries to manipulate her into falling in love with him. He stalks Maggie. He le- This is a bitch move on, Fred, uh, on Ted's part. <laughs> he leaves his own mother's wedding and refuses to give a speech because he believes that he should be married first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolute. Classic absolute beta Ted. male soy boy Ted Mosby. <laughs> He bribes Stella's ex-husband and father of her daughter with like an actual bribe to to get him to like not try to rekindle the romance. Keep that keep that child in a broken home. <laughs> yeah, I think um Stella is probably the woman that he's the second worst to on the show, other than Robin, of course. Mm-hmm. Where I would He literally kills Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'll get into this later, but yeah, I think, I mean, he's also, I, he murders Tracy. <laughs> he was Robin. Spoilers. With Stella, he forces her into a relationship, pressures her to move faster. When she reciprocates, he then breaks up with her, then proposes to her, then invites her exes to uh, their wedding without telling her. Uh, and then when she decides to go back to her child's father, Ted breaks up their relationship and refuses to help fix it. It's called being a wild card. It's uh, <laughs> your partners can never expect your next move. Which is fine. <laughs> Which is fine, but you need to frame the character that way. He he also starts the relationship by forcing her to break HIPAA and and date one yeah. of her patients. Stella is so a he's doctor. got that on her for out the door. Uh, there's also a woman a named host. Royce apparently who accepts Ted's baggage and then he immediately rejects her when she mentions sort of her own baggage and tells her yeah. Yeah, she has to go. <laughs> Um, he also throws away his relationship with Victoria in order to stay friends with a woman he once cheated on her with. Um, so this is classic Ted Mosby. And and then uh, nine years later, tries to uh, like just jump back in to Victoria's life. Uh, oh. Victoria now like in a happy relationship. No, leave him. I've always loved you. I'm an architect. <laughs> I think that, I mean, Ted is sort of the ultimate fuck boy, I think, because he's worse because at least Barney is like, yeah, you know what? Like I'm, I'm fucking around and like, this is who I am. Where Ted is this guy. And let's just say, I know some people who are like this and we're like, no, I'm looking for love, but like, I have this crazy expectation. And if you don't meet that, like, oh yeah, then it's on to the next person. Let's, let's describe some of the stuff that Ted does to Robin over the years, our our beautiful Canadian heroine. Yes. (laughs) National treasure. Colby Smolders or something about <laughs> Colby Smolders. I think that's her name, dude. I think it's Colby she, re- she really does too. She she really does Smolders. Oh, okay. Is she actually Canadian? I didn't know that. She, yeah, dude. Uh, we'll get to her in a second. Um, okay, so Robin that, shows up late to a wedding. So um, Ted, while they're dating, and Ted refocuses his romantic, his romantic feelings on basically the closest woman next to him. Uh, he lies to her that he and his girlfriend broke up so that he can sleep with her. He shows up to her award show with a hot date he thinks is a prostitute. He has her get rid of her dog. King shit. And she, he shames dog her the number of people she sleeps with. Yeah, I mean, she has too many dogs, but... Like, so really pluralize that dog. She has like Also, eight. Ted is like a great white shark. For whenever Robin is at her lowest, he smells blood in the water and instantly it's like the moment she finds out she's barren, he's there. The worst of that is that Barney spends the entire series encouraging Ted to be like that and Ted spends the series rebuking Barney. Like, no, I'm a good guy. But he's all, he's doing the same thing anyway. He just like is pretending to not. 
Yeah. Like I said in the introduction, they'll have these little partners. They'll be brought on for four or six episodes. Like Cal Penn played a partner for Robin for a little bit. He played her therapist that she started dating. Speaking of like HIPAA violations. Yeah. They keep doing that. (laughs) Um, But anytime one of these little arcs ends, you just knew they were going to do something with Ted and Robin. He was going to throw himself at her some way, in some way, shape, or form. You know, to reiterate here, like, you can do all this stuff. This is this is all money stuff. <laughs> it's really great stuff, guys. <laughs> but the problem is that, like, he's never ridiculed by his friends for his creepy behavior. He's ridiculed for being a romantic. Yes. <laughs> yeah. mi- missed the point entirely. There's a channel on YouTube that's done by Oscar Stinson that I recommend everyone check out if you want to see more How I Met Your Mother clips. Because he's also this super fan who kind of misses the point of a lot of these jokes. He has a title that's like Marshall Erickson breaking gender norms for 20 straight minutes. And it's just 20 minutes of gags where the show is laughing at Marshall for being a girl. (laughs) Get it? He has feelings. Get it? He dances. Get it? He's... I mean, I feel like we got all of it, but hes you're supposed to project as the audience. So he has these snide little remarks. He never quite gyms the camera like The Office because the show doesn't really break the fourth wall that way. He but gyms the camera constantly a- as the narrator. You, you kind of glossed over the fact that Ted is also the narrator. We have two Teds constantly on screen and one is always gymming the, the audience as the narrator. Future yes. Ted, Bob Saget, is constantly there to talk directly to you and break the fourth wall. Yeah. I I think Ted also has the most like snide little sarcastic Chandler-esque commentary on like Barney or whoever. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, he he is the unreliable narrator. So, and this is something the show has a lot of fun with. This is where I think it like sometimes takes some risks. So when he's telling the story to his children, he doesn't want to talk about smoking weed. So they call it eating sandwiches. And then in the flashbacks, everyone's eating like a big baguette sandwich to indicate that they're smoking weed. There's an episode where he, he doesn't want to say shit. So he says, I'm too, uh, I'm getting too old for that stuff or whatever. But in the whole show right. is framed around this guy telling stories to his children. The whole thing is an unreliable narrator. And even in the unreliable narration, Dude's still a piece of shit. Yeah, it's his cleaned up, idealized version of himself from his 20s that is mostly like, kids, back in 2005, I was banging my way through all of New York City. (laughs) In fact, a service came to me and said, mathematically, sir, you've banged everyone that you could possibly bang in New York City. Kids, that's how cool your dad is. (laughs) Yeah, in 2005, I was laying a lot of pipes. (laughs) And I was love bombing women to do it. (laughs) Kids, your we mom goes even... <laughs> dead, and I want to go back to Lake. <laughs> <laughs> no, but actually, that's what the show is about. Kids, that is what your, the show is about. your dad used to fuck, and I know your mom is dead, but I'd like to get back to that. Daddy horny. <laughs> Daddy's home. Uh, Daddy okay. horny, Luke and Penny. Let's let's move on. To, speaking of daddy horny, <laughs> let's move on to Barney. Um, so Barney, great character. I think probably the, the best character on the show. He's he's a horn dog who who isn't horny in a way, right? So this was a kind of guy. In the he's kind dogs. of a dry boy, uh, despite his uh, levacious characterization. He frequently acts in a very non horny way. Yeah, uh, played by Neil Patrick Harris. Well, uh, yes, yeah. yeah. So this was a kind of guy in the two thousands. So Barney's very sort of emblematic of like the the pickup artist subculture of the of the two thousands, right? This was sort of big at the time. Uh, books like The Game and The Mystery Method had come out, and we're advocating for peacocking and negging and freezing freezing out of and like all these elaborate sort of schemes that you can do to pick up women. <laughs> and I feel like Barney is sort of an outgrowth of that. If you're wondering why Zoomers had to start using the term gaslight, it's because of this two. 2000 subculture. <laughs> um, so Barney stands in daddy of gaslighting. <laughs> Speaking of uh, sort of, he's like a horny guy who isn't horny. Um, so Jim Parsons apparently was almost cast as Barney Simpson, who's also gay. And it makes me wonder if they wanted to somehow like cast a gay man, either consciously or subconsciously, because I don't know if like either of these actors were out yet. And I'd sort of take the edge off them and try to make the character likable, even though, you know, they're a monster. It's like this, we want a guy who fucks a lot, but like actually isn't like horny or threatening. And I think it's very funny that Barney is masculine in a way that Trump is masculine. Like he like yes. suits and fucking women, but like can't use a hammer or drive and is like emotionally affected by everything. When he orders something, he asks for just a sous of creme fraiche because dairy makes him bloaty. 
when uh, they flash forward to future Barney, he often looks pretty much exactly like Trump. He's got like a puffy orange face and like now artificially blonde comb over hair. Still in a suit. And yet he is sort of like held like Trump is like he's held up to be sort of the pinnacle of masculinity. Um, mm-hmm. in, in, like with the books like The Bro Code, which from what I understand, is it true that you own The Bro Code and, and many of the other like book deals uh, that they did? Yeah, I, I have uh, two of the tie-in books, The Bro Code and um, shit, what's the other one? Give me a second, uh, I gotta there's the pregnancy mind. book, What to Expect When You're Awesome or something of that. Age. <laughs> did, did you pick up that one, Mike? No, but I, I didn't even know that one existed. I might have to pick that up and uh, give it to my brother. I just had Scooter um, pull, pull, pull up the list of Barney Stinson books here. We yeah, got, thanks, um, The Bro Code, Bro on the Go, The Playbook, Bro Code for Parents. Oh, yeah, I got The Playbook and The Bro Code. I don't have Bro <laughs> on There's also something called Le Bro Code, which I think that's just the French translation of the Bro Code. Really? It's just the Bro Code in French. It's only in two languages, French and English. No one else. <laughs> um yeah so let's let's get into his darkness and grotesqueness because like he, he's he is problematic right and and we don't want to get into this whole thing where we're like hmm, but now you could never make a show like that you know um, yeah yeah part of the reason why i think barney is a little bit more acceptable is because like i said like he's a devil like you are meant to see him as like a horrible person and you're not meant to emulate his behavior even if like a bunch of people did right like they can't help that look at tony soprano you know like yeah you're, you're meant to take him as a monster and some some people walk around with like I'm the boss and you gotta listen to what I say Tony Soprano shirts and like, and like take him to be an awesome person but whatever you can't help how people interpret your art if people watch the Colbert show and somehow like take him seriously then like that's their fault and they huh? did they did yeah that always blows my mind that there were like Colbert watchers who somehow were like yep <laughs> he's right but, you know I, uh, I have a theory that the entire like full modern slide of uh, that like you know the whole group of people the the you know the alt right as they call them it mm-hmm. was actually started by stephen colbert it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy thing interesting okay um so i i put together a list here of, of the worst things barney did to get laid and i just wanted to preface it with that so he sold a woman for a mercedes we don't see that on off screen. screen off screen yeah off screen okay um, he <laughs> He dresses up as Mrs. Stintzfire uh, to spy on college girls. Uh, he has multiple allusions to setting up cameras to record women without their consent. In multiple apartments. In apartments that aren't even his. Just a yeah. network of cameras. Uh, he creates a prenup in his marriage with Quinn, where he puts in a clause that states that there will be weekly weigh-ins, and if she weighs too much, she'll owe him money. He tells a woman he's been poisoned, that she has to suck his dick to get the poison out. <laughs> and one of the Barney quotes is that, said the only reason to wait a month to have sex with a woman is if she's 17 and 11 months. Okay, piece of How I Met Your Mother fanfic. We know in the show Barney has this criminal corporate job, which is to provide legal exculpation and sign everything, or please, for short. Fan fiction, Barney Stinson, Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> he was for sure on the Jeffrey Epstein, Epstein plane. Yes. He named it, in fact. He thought he was very classy. Uh, the lead. Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so... He also thinks the ninth commandment uh, in the Bible is no fat chicks. Um, one of where Barney schemes to get laid is called the Soul Man, where he dons blackface to sleep with a woman who only sleeps with black guys, and he changes his <laughs> name to Barnell. <laughs> Again, off screen. This is something that even in whatever 2005 you couldn't put on television. Yeah, let's well, let's uh, get it. Let's actually go back to Little St. James with Barney Stinson. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's let's flesh that bit out a little bit. That's good stuff. <laughs> you can't just skip over. They it, it's a move called Lolita Express. And you find a high school girl whose parents have just died and <laughs> is insecure, and you convince her to give you massages. <laughs> and then you fly her to an island where she has no agency. Ted, Ted, I don't need you as a wingman anymore. I've got the greatest wingman in New York City, Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> With him, every night is legend, wait for it, Derry. <laughs> Uh, so he goes into a character called Barn <laughs> Barn Lane Maxwell Stinswell <laughs> Barn, Barn Lane Stinswell. <laughs> Barney with big tits. 
Give me a high 15. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing good happens after uh, 16 years old. <laughs> <laughs> that was Barney's quote when he was hanging around with FC. <laughs> Instead of the crazy hot scale, it's like the AG hot scale. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so Barney's a monster. Um, the whole framing device of uh, the playbook episode is, in and of itself is probably his most like acutely displayed psychopathy where he concocts a Machiavellian scheme that involves him planting himself in the middle like the Saw villain, except it's a comedy, so he's dressed in a scuba suit just sitting there waiting for people to ask him about the scuba suit. Yeah, just insanely elaborate plans. And they're dependent on a thousand and one things going right. And this is also a 2000s movie trope. Oh, 100%. Like, remember when the Joker in The Dark hey, Knight goes into prison right. and actually there were, like, <laughs> it's, the, it's the classic, the bad guy's caught, but he's really the one in control. You see it in all of the super movie, hero movies. You see it in Bond. You see it in fucking everything. And Barney most, is most just that. Watch- I think in this specific case, it really adds actually to like the characterization because even though he comes out of the boat like flanderized, one of the reasons Barney's softened as a character is because he's like literally a showman. Like this guy is into magic. So you just kind of put up with the hoodwinks because you know that he's always actually trying to put on a show rather than just it being like a thing that he does. Like, yeah, that goes back to how you were saying they're like trying to soften the character by maybe subconsciously even casting a gay guy. I'd read earlier that apparently he was originally envisioned as a John Belushi in Animal House type character, <laughs> which would have been hilarious. Yeah, but probably not come off as well. <laughs> so, it, you know, they make him gay. They make him a magician. They make him uh, the effet fancy Trumpian kind of masculine, and it all softens the uh, abject psychopathy. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. If, if John Belushi is walking around an amnesia ward with photos of his quote unquote children in a wedding ring trying to fuck the women, it seems a lot sadder. <laughs> <laughs> Wearing the college shirt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's talk about how they humanize him, right? They give him these sort of daddy issues. And like you said, they, they soften him maybe with this sort of magician stuff. And he's like almost childlike in some ways, right? And, and he, lo- he loves his friends, you know. And because he's this scheming psychopath, it means that every now and then other characters will mess with him and we can laugh at it unproblematically. So there's an episode again Ooh. late in it where Robin throws him his bachelor party and she makes it the worst night of his life. Like so much so that she pretends to break off the engagement. And it's like, it's just a, a reversal of the power dynamic and we can all laugh at it, even though what she did is super mean. All right, getting getting back to the most pivotal sitcom of the 2000s. Yeah. Uh, Malcolm in the middle. Malcolm in the middle. <laughs> so let's move on to Mar- Marshall and, and Robin and Lily will be quite quick because there's not really much to say about them. They're, They're one of- character. <laughs> yeah, I mean, practically. They're stock characters. And the women, I mean, this show is clearly made by two men because the women on the show are like just completely one dimensional and there's really nothing going on. So let's go, let's just uh, finish this off. Marshall, uh, Ben mentions that he's sort of made fun of this for his masculinity. He's like the actual good guy of the show. He occasionally acts as the, the moral conscience. So there's an episode where he yells at Ted for acting like Barney. It's like when the show kind of almost approaches uh self-awareness about how ted's a shitty person he's from small town minnesota which the show harps on all the time and i had the realization like i think the show lasted him for being cringe before we knew what cringe was before we all became so cynical this is like the proto cringe guy he believes in bigfoot and all this kind of silly stuff he has a a stand-up routine called the fish list where he just lists fish and their wacky names and he marshall marries lily in the second season and stays married to her for the duration of the series so a lot of his plot lines are classic domestic plot lines that you will see in a sitcom with married people so they struggle with infertility for a little bit there you have issues of who's going to have what career within the marriage they had, they really stressed the shit out like Taffy, but where were they going to live? Were they going to live downtown or in the suburbs? 
This is how you know it's not really a show for millennials. We ain't buying fucking houses. (laughs) This is some Gen X bullshit where it's like, oh, I get to choose where I get to live. Honestly, this show sort of outs themselves as being a Gen X show just by the fact that they lived in the Upper West Side. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Like the the contemporary millennial made shows of its time, like uh, Girls in Broad City or both set in Brooklyn, were were the real... Uh, Wait, so I'm where, that part out. Real I'm, New York, Brooklyn. Yeah. Wait, why are you cutting that out? Because I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to say something positive. I don't want a sincere post. Oh. Yeah, like like I'm Marshall. <laughs> Let's move on to Robin. So Robin is is the, the better female. So like I said, this show is like created by two guys, and it it see it seeped into the show so much because both of the female characters are like very one sided, and the only reason that like Robin is a good character is because she's basically a guy. And so I feel like they had an easier time writing her, right? She's independent. She's the most traditionally masculine character on the show. She shoots, she smokes, she spills whiskey, she fucks, she's career oriented. She's, you know, she's Canadian, which is like probably the most masculine thing you could be. Yeah, it's so, true. Um, in, in the eyes of the effect, New Yorkers, yes. <laughs> Come on, man, don't have a fucking out us. We're Canadian as they come. When it's convenient well, for us. Robin very much, while she's like three-dimensionalized because they wrote her as like a guy, as Jordan says, at the same time that like makes her also the most one-dimensional character because like the one of the guys trope is literally just like, yes, we have uh, gender swapped this dude. Right. So here you go. Love one interest. Of the, one of the tropes people usually do is to give a character like this the name Alex. Alex or some sort of like gender neutral name like Jamie or something like that. Um, Robin. And, yeah, I mean Robin, I guess they that's like the one they're like, oh, what if we just don't give them the name Alex, but we make the character an Alex type character? I feel like Ro- Robin, Robin is a gender neutral. I have name. an uncle Robin. Yeah. Like it's gender really? neutral. Yeah. Also Batman. Especially in Canada. It's like literally a superhero. As doodly as they come. The 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 boy wonder. <laughs> I don't know, man. Robin. <laughs> That's why they stuff. don't call you Batman. <laughs> yeah. And of course, you have Lily rounding up our cast of five characters. Uh, she is Marshall's wife. Again, kind of like a, I don't know, like a Hallmark movie female lead. She's uh, She is the she... only one of the main cast to win an Emmy for her role, and I think that's absolutely ridiculous. That is ridiculous. All, what I'll say about Lily. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, when they actually have to commit to making a female character, it's it's quite obvious that like they, they just didn't have as much juice or sauce <laughs> that they had for like uh, something like Barney. Um, yeah, I mean, she she wants also, to be artsy, but she's not very good at art. And like all of, like I said about Marshall, like most of the problems, most of the drama involves just like domestic stuff in her role as wife. She's also like a meddling gossip, which is, again, like a very flat, one-dimensional sitcom woman written by men. Yeah, she provides kind of like a foil to Barney's overt plottingness and kind of like she's just as psychopathically manipulative. Uh, in one episode being revealed to have like broken up every relationship Ted has ever been in, even though she's just like his best friend's girlfriend. It's like, she's not even very invested in his entire life. Just knows him by happenstance, but sees it necessary to completely shape the uh, group dynamic around her kind of like views herself. They all view themselves as the main character, which I think is the most three dimensional aspect of any of the characters. They have kind of the, uh, the selfishness of uh, your classic, Seinfeldian characters going on but uh, tried to mash into more of a a likable friends type setting so uh, Lily though I think isn't necessarily the worst main character because she's like written flatly although I I agree that the, the writers were really phoning it in on the female characters but I also am really blaming it on Allison Hannigan not being a good actress. No, just like just no. terrible. Dead. I that's my hot take on it. It's- so those are our characters. Those are our five intrepid heroes. And now I guess we'll just talk in like broad strokes about what this thing is. And we kind yeah. of already did a lot of this in the intro. Like maybe we'll end up moving that shit down here. Right. Yeah. Let's just talk about the episode structure. Like what is it? How I Met Your Mother uh, episode look like? Uh, in in as a as a big idea, right? Like. You know, we all know about, um, for example, like the, the Twitter account Seinfeld 2000 and how they can sort of like, you can sort of put together like a Seinfeld episode just by saying dumb things like, oh, Kramer's hoarding COVID masks or something, right? Like, 
Um, so what does that look like for how I met your mother? I think well, Ben you, said it up best is schizophrenic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you're going to have the Bob Saget voiceover narration, which, of course, it I is. mean, I, I'm not the first person to point this out. This was, I think, a joke in, like, Family Guy or whatever. But, like, why would Ted's 20-year-old voice be so different from his 40-year-old voice? <laughs> I expected an in-universe explanation, like some smoke inhalation, and they didn't pull it off. And that was my biggest disappointment in the whole series, actually. Okay. <laughs> biggest? <laughs> biggest? The biggest. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? <laughs> So yeah, you're going to have a voiceover that's going to talk in a flashback about the current year. Uh, you're going to have some hijinks from Barney. You're going to have, they'll probably involve some, something involving dating and romance in New York City. The, Bar the Marshall and Lily plot line is going to involve something involving couple or family life. And I think within all of this, like very, I keep overusing this expression, but run of the mill kind of stuff, you can occasionally have fun little observations about human life. So Jornado alluded to the hot crazy scale. You know, they have these rules. So, you know, Barney says that if a woman is crazy, she needs to be at least as correspondingly hot or nothing good happens after 2 a.m. Or, oh, the, the platinum rule where Barney Stinson thinks that the golden rule is love thy neighbor, but the platinum rule is never love thy neighbor. And the idea is that you don't want to shit where you eat when it comes to dating. Uh, and then the show will have like some fun little observations about social niceties. Sometimes. I, I keep There's the, the five word sentences that every guy will say one time in his life. And though it's a central focus of one episode, I can jump that far. It's, <laughs> it's something that comes up consistently in a bunch of different episodes. You know, they never lampshade it, but there are a bunch of like stupid, stupid incidents that are incited by one of the male characters characters saying like we should buy a bar yeah <laughs> uh, yeah it uh it, it borrowed a lot from like seinfeld and that social commentary that it provided it kind of was cool when they would talk about something like the, is there an episode where there's a concept of like the glass shattering and it's like you find out something about a person and yeah, then the like spoiler how, is that what it's called there's spoiler alert or something like that yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like when you're super close friends or when you love someone, you don't notice one particular annoying trait that they do. And then once it gets pointed out to you, you can't unsee it. And they play the sound effect of the glass shattered. Like that sounds like a Seinfeld episode, right? Yeah. The glass is shattered, Jerry. It's shattered! <laughs> It's shattered. It's completely shattered. She's a loud eater, Ted. I can hear everything she eats. I think is actually how Marshall reacts to Lily being a loud eater. Something along those lines. <laughs> but I think what stands out about this, again, if we're going to do the Seinfeld comparison, Seinfeld takes these outlandish, wacky people. Like Kramer is definitely the wackiest. And then George is just Larry David with all of his social misanthropy. And they put them in totally everyday situations, waiting for a table at a Chinese restaurant or um, what, trying to find your, your car in a parking garage. And you have wacky people in normal situations. Uh, How I Met Your Mother, I think like we've said, so many of these characters, you're on either one of two extremes. You're like very flat or you're like Ted or Barney and you're a fucking caricature. You're like way wackier than even some of the Seinfeld people. And I think the show makes a lot of hay out of putting them in irregular situations and stuff that wouldn't necessarily happen in real life. Uh, direct comparison, Seinfeld, you're waiting in line at a Chinese restaurant. How I Met Your Mother, your old apartment is a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that's necessary for the show because the characters are so flat, at least most of them are, that like in, in order to get these translucent bag of wet napkins to do anything, you have to turn their apartment into a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> like you have to put them in some sort of like supernatural situation, essentially. In, in a way, they're like kind of live action Simpsons characters sometimes, right down to occasionally episodes revolve around a giant musical number, which was yes. uh, some of the best days of the Simpsons. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they kind of lean off off of that as the show goes on which is a shame because i think it was one of the strengths of the earlier seasons the show is also very sincere too like it, it tended to be sentimental uh in a way that, like seinfeld wasn't yeah um, characters uh kind of learn lessons at times there's at least some growth and development of them over the series yeah, yeah. and there's 
So let's talk a little bit about reboots because there's actually quite a few of them. There's a lot of like, it's like, how do they reproduce this magic that like literally only worked under very specific circumstances, I think. Um, and again, like we said earlier, they made tie-in products that Mike brought. They were, <laughs> that Mike bought. Well, I received his gifts. <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry, I don't mean to disparage your good, <laughs> don't disparage your taste. Oh, I'm just saying I was in high school. I didn't have that kind of throwing around fliff. Yeah. <laughs> like this, obviously people want to capture this lightning in the bottle again so that they can make even more tie-in products from their network TV show. But yeah, what have the attempts been so far? And, and I mean, I don't think they'll ever work. One, because like I said, like our current culture is a little bit more cynical and self-aware. And I just don't think that like, ha I don't know, having the same sort of like approach will work. Uh, they made a reboot in 2014 and there's a pilot available online. Like, have you watched it called How I Met Your Dad? Uh, no, I didn't know they made an episode of How I Met Your Dad. I thought it died in utero. <laughs> no, they, they made the pilot. Apparently it is, it is out there. You can find it. And now there's a new show coming out called How I Met Your Father. This I know about. Yeah. And it stars uh, Hilary Duff and Kim Cattrall as future Sophie. Yep. Yep. Who the hell is Sophie? If not a character in How I Met Your Mother. Oh, I thought it would be like Tracy. Like Nancy It's Gold. supposed to be a sequel. So I guess they're going to go down a that 80s show route where like <laughs> maybe one of the characters is a second cousin of one of the main characters. Bro, and it's going to be terrible <laughs> because the main fucking characters is a Sophie's Choice pun. Who's Sophie going to choose? Ah, that sucks so bad. <laughs> Um, I think it's a it's it's a sequel in the sense that some of the Fast and the Furious movies are sequels. I'm thinking particular of Fast and the Furious colon Tokyo Drift, whose only tenuous connection to the other one is like this movie has cars and it's got babes. It has none of the same characters or story elements. But it's you know, part you of know what it's carrying forward: Par Pamela Fryman, uh, EP and director. Um, contrasting the only written by two guys, Pamela Fryman directs almost every episode of How I Met Your Mother. Yeah, and wow. uh, was very close with the cast. And she's, I think, been the driving force be behind the re reboot slash sequels move. Uh, Carter Bayes and Craig Thomas seem to not really care. And after they like, I th they tried to pick up How I Met Your Dad, but the studio like wanted them to reshoot the pilot, I guess. Mm -hmm. Scooter just told me in my uh, in my earpiece. <laughs> and Hardest they, working guy on, like this, on this pod, that Scooter. We, we would literally not be able to do this without the efforts of fucking Scooter. Yeah, so thank you, Scooter. He's working for a college credit, and um, we told him we're accredited. So we, we have to look. Scooter, can you look into whether or not we were accredited to get our college credit? Yeah, I mean, there's so many CUNY schools. I mean, we got We have to be part of the CUNY system. That's... He, he tells me that they just were like, no, we're not going to reshoot the pilot. So they passed on the pickup. Very funny. <laughs> Yes. Um, they also made two uh, two international versions of How I Met Your Mother. I don't know if you knew this, but they they, they made met, two they made How I Met Your Mother Tokyo Drift. <laughs> How I met your Japanese mothers out there because I did not know that, and I got to watch it right away. There is both a two seasons, two full seasons of a Russian version of How I Met Your Mother, and two full seasons of a Lebanese version of How I Met Your Mother. <laughs> So what, I thought we'd just take a moment to look at what the Russian version would be like. And I, cause I think Scooter, just, we get that clip up. Yeah. Okay. I think it'll just be like how I met your mother and she didn't like me. <laughs> I imagine the character how of Barty just going around and she and had being no like, other choice. Track suit up. And then they zip up their Adidas track suits. <laughs> Kids, nothing good ever happens. <laughs> There's also two seasons of a Lebanese version, and I think it would sound a little something <laughs> like this. Uh, how about each member of the gang is like a different sect, you know? Like a... Su Sunni Shia Christian. Uh, obviously, Barney is the Maronite Christian. Uh, Marshall and Lily are clearly Shia. And Robin and Ted are the Sunnis of the gang. Well, we're Robin something different. No, Robin's got to be oh, something yeah. different. Like a Curtis. Because she's Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> no, Rob Robin is still Canadian. All right, let's wrap this up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I I'd like to talk about the ending for a bit because a lot of people have talked about the ending. And I think what's kind of unique, or not unique about the show, but a pattern we can ex extrapolate from How I Met Your Mother is that if your show hinges on a mystery, like this one, there's a mystery right in the title. Uh, it, you better nail the ending. Like, if you want to have any kind of cultural relevance going forward. 
Uh, I've heard this called like the Game of Thrones effect. This was Game of Thrones is the last show that everyone watched. They completely botched the ending, and you don't really hear I did people not talk watch about it. it. The show ends. We have our frame device. Ted needs to meet the mother. The mother is not Robin. The show spends the last season, the ninth season, spends 22 episodes over the 72 hours of Barney and Robin's wedding. They build up this kind of romantic ending for the show. You know, how how does any rom-com end as with a happily ever after? We spend so many hours on this. And then and now the last, we're edging. We're just sorry, edging. What? And now we're edging. Yeah. The, the last <laughs> season of How I Met Your Mother is edging. <laughs> And you, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. Um, thank God we can fix all this in post. Um, murder train of thought. Yes, okay. <laughs> murder train of thought. <laughs> nice. For those of you who don't know, murder train is a recurring song in How I Met Your Mother. <laughs> but this show actually nails the introduction of the mother. They introduce this character piece by piece. So, or not piece by piece. They introduce her, her interacting with the gang one at a time. <laughs> First, kids, did I ever tell you the story of how I got your mother's finger in the mail before I met her? <laughs> so the the mother is played by what's her name? Like Kristen something or whatever. Christine Milioti. Christine Milioti. And she nails it. She's well written. It's acted well. She interacts with each of the characters in a time of crisis. It makes them feel good and better and whatever. So as Robin's trying has cold feet, tries to run away from the wedding, she bumps into the mother of Ted's children, but she solves it. So people are getting kind of excited. Like, oh look, they they did it. It's working. In the last episode, they do a bait and nice switch. They nail the meet you. And then they have Barney and Robin get divorced like seconds after we just spent an entire season waiting for them to get married so that yeah. Barney can clear the way for Ted. The kids say, okay, you told her this whole long story about mom. And she's barely in it. This is because you want to date Robin. And then in the frame device with Ted with like spray on fake gray hair goes to Robin's window. She is still single in the spinster or whatever with all of her dogs. And they get together at the end. And people were so pissed about this. And the reason we got this ending is because there was so much time between seasons. You could get audience feedback and whatever. The characters kind of grow, grew and developed in ways that they didn't anticipate. Barney and Robin kind of worked on screen. You know, she's fanatically independent. So is he. They both have their weird hangups about commitment. And then they grow together and this, that, and the other, whatever. So we got invested in that. And they did a bait and switch at the very end to this thing that made everyone mad. And the reason for this, the ostensible reason that they said is they knew from season two that this was the ending because the actors who played the children in the frame device were going to age. So they knew that they had to shoot the ending first. So they shot their shot in season two, way back in 2006 or whatever, that it was gonna end with a bait and switch, dead mother back with Robin. That was the plan. And then they spent eight years doing the opposite, just building an elaborate bait and Yeah, I keep using bait and switch. I need more words. Fuck. <laughs> but if you know the ending that you need to get to, why in the hell would you make all of the choices that they made? Just going in the exact opposite direction. For money, Benjamin. <laughs> yeah. they, they, had, they had a very lucrative deal. The main cast apparently was originally all signed in for eight seasons. So the ninth season almost didn't happen. And they were going to smash cut from the meat cute to mother is dead. Mm -hmm. But then like they got Jason Segal to reluctantly agree to be like on a green screen set for a few scenes for the last season. You know, he's like barely there. Mm -hmm. But I, I think like having rewatched at least the beginning and ending that I and firmly in the camp they knew exactly they were going to do that from the first episode like he introduces though they put a cap on robin not being the mother in the first episode he st still introduces her as the love of my life which is a weird way to start off the story that's not about her <laughs> the story is about her yeah I, I watched the finale for the first time last night and this morning, and it's really like remarkable, like what they were able to do with the ending because it was good. Like I, you know, they redeem Barney, they they give a nice send off to Marshall and Lily, and then like you know Ted and meeting uh, his their mother is is great. It's just like it's it's just so funny how much they fumbled the ball the goal line. Someone on Reddit had even posted like an HD version. Like people have made fan versions, obviously, where like yeah, he, he marries this girl. And they live happily ever after together. And like the way it's presented in the show is so awkward and clumsy because like Ben said, you spend the entire season getting to know like Robin and Barney together and, and seeing them sort of get hitched. And then within like 
30, like with 30 minutes, they're divorced. And then you, you spend the entire season getting to love this, this uh, Tracy character. <laughs> and then right before the ending, they're like, yeah, and then she died. And murdered. <laughs> murdered by <laughs> Ted Mosby. I like to believe actually that like that last part is just like fucked up Ted Mosby. This is like the, the dream that he has every night where he wishes his wife was dead and so he could run back to Robin. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I view the show in that lens. Rob, uh, sorry, Marshall has a fantasy early in the series where he like has to have Lily get killed off in his masturbation fantasies so he can like appropriately approach another woman. <laughs> um, leading, le- leaning into that fear- theory. Yes, um, I, I think if you were... dream, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She, she has to die every time. And I was um, there by her bedside reading to her. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of foreshadowing for the ending, if we're being honest. Like, that's, yeah, you know, you can only be truly happy after the love of your life dies. <laughs> <laughs> that's the moral of the story. <laughs> the, the moral of the story is uh, life's about the journey, not the destination, because uh, the destination is just dying. Yeah, yeah, and that's a great point because hopefully you can watch the show with that lens that how i met your mother is about the journey and not the horrible ending yeah yeah i mean this is if if you want your show to have rewatch value it doesn't you don't need to nail nail the ending i mean friends gradually declined in quality and then had like a very basic ending you know yeah surprise ross ends up with rachel like the office they would would they (laughs) they Uh, will they 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 would (laughs) Uh, yeah, The Office also declines in quality, doesn't have a good ending, but people still rewatch those like crazy. I think the difference is that how I met your mother... Because they just kind of taper off, I think. All right, yes, let's wrap up. Uh, I think this is one of the original dudes rock shows, because also yes. the women are dudes. Oh, yeah. And it's about hanging out with your boys. Mm-hmm. D- jumping onto trains in suits. <laughs> yeah. Very inspirational. <laughs> Yes. It, it was very instructional, that's for sure. I, I Yeah, I watched this and I was like, damn, I need to get sued. The, the creators just, like, bought stock in a bunch of suit companies and then pitched the show to every network they could. It was all <laughs> it was all a play from the playbook to make some money. It's funny because, <laughs> because there's another show from this decade called <laughs> Suits. <laughs> they yeah, the suits there's a whole cabal. Okay. Everybody uh-huh. was in on it. They're uh-huh. just trying to sell suits through TV. Thanks for joining so much, Mike. We'll have to have you back when we watch How I Met Your Father once that becomes a huge hit. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you for your expert opinion and uh, expert callbacks. Expert. Yeah, and for all the listeners, I just, I hope you find your future partner. I hope you, you know, just destroy everyone's lives on the way to find your own happiness. So if you take, take a page out of Ted Mosby, Architects Playbook, And uh, yeah, go out and uh, love bomb everyone you know. Mm -hmm. And then eventually wind up with someone you meet at the 11th hour anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Through sheer coincidence. The one person you don't love bomb, that's the one. Nice. All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. 